Thank you very much for the interview. Uh, perhaps if we could start, if you could give us an update on what has happened since COP16 in Cancun. In Cancun, as you know, Red Plus was essentially launched, uh, agreed upon. I mean, um, the, the, the approach to uh, preventing deforestation and forest degradation, you know, or, or reducing emissions from deforestation and and forest degradation was adopted by countries in in Cancun. The safeguards were adopted. The, the concept of providing policy incentives and supporting policy incentives uh, uh, to reduce emissions from deforestation and land and forest degradation was was essentially adopted. But uh, three outstanding things remain. And the first is, uh, from a political point of view, the de a decision on finances, on how Red Plus will be financed, was postponed to Durban. Uh, and then there are two technical issues that have to be elaborated and then adapted, which is guidance on reference levels, which is how countries uh, will essentially measure, report, and verify their emission reductions and, and the levels from which they start that, that MRV. Uh, and uh, safeguards, uh, guidance on how to implement uh, what's called an information system for safeguards. So we're discussing that. So the, since Cancun, what we're doing now is to discuss uh, and negotiate and try to arrive at agreement on this guidance, and it's happening in Substa, uh, in, in, in the UNFCCC. And uh, for the finance discussion, that's happening in the ad hoc working group on long-term cooperative action, or what's called the LCA group in the UNFCCC. So where are we now on safeguards? There is agreement, broad agreement on safeguards, on, on the principles, on what those safeguards should be. They're essentially social safeguards, so protection of indigenous people's rights, of community rights, of the rights of stakeholders, uh, right to information, those type of things. There's governance safeguards uh, related to transparency, accountability, anti-corruption. Um, and then there is uh, environmental safeguards related to environmental integrity, to protection of biodiversity, etc. Uh, that's agreed. No need to do anything else for that. But what's not agreed or what's not developed and therefore agreed uh, is the system with which countries report how they're implementing safeguards. So that's being negotiated uh, now. Uh, and over the last nine months, uh, before Durban or the last since June, but essentially, and up to Panama, uh, we've had discussions um, both within the process but also outside the process to expert workshops to actually elaborate this. How, how you know? I mean, it's not as easy as it looks. You know, I mean, uh, what kind of reporting countries will do? Who will do the reviewing? Um, you know, obviously there's tension between the countries. There are those who say, well, you know, countries should just unilaterally report what they're doing with safeguards. Others say, no, no, there needs to be some kind of format for reporting, some kind of review. So uh, in Durban, in the next two weeks, the, the parties will, will look at this again, will get the information and the discussions, the results of the discussions, including an expert workshop that was done in, in Panama, uh, and then they'll decide. Uh, hopefully, they'll adopt what's called a guidance document and then give it to the conference of the parties for the conference of the parties to officially adopt as the guidance for countries on how they will implement and report on safeguards. Where are we on MRV, monitoring, reporting, and verification, and the debate between RER, reference emission levels, and RL, uh, reference levels? That's less advanced than safeguards, not because we didn't pay attention to it, but it's a much more complex and difficult issue, and it's a technical issue. And the truth is that many countries are not really prepared to implement an MRV system to engage, you know, in detail technically on these issues. In Bonn, you know, there was an initial discussion on what countries thought should be. Uh, no, no consensus emerging about about all the different issues, you know, but a really honest, frank exchange of what needed to be done to get to where we want to be so that we can implement Red Plus, right? And just this month in November, there was a, a meeting in Bonn of experts to try to, to elaborate this further. Uh, I think the real key question is not so much, I think, REL or REL, it's really how countries also politically now will choose their baselines. Because that it's not going to be a technical question, right? I mean, the, 
there's technical issues around it, but that eventually will be a political question. You know, how, how, how do you um, uh, take into account national circumstances, you know what I mean, unique circumstances? How do you compare, do you actually even compare between countries? Um, there's been some good technical work. I mean, I think uh, the Meridian Institute, for example, I think with the support of Norway, uh, has developed this document, I mean, uh, on, on reference levels. I think C4 itself has produced a number of papers to assist countries in doing that. Uh, but that needs to trickle to, down to negotiators to be able to make that decision. So we see, I think, uh, I think there's some uncertainty of you know, the extent through which we can adopt you know, uh, a decision on reference levels by the end of, um, of Durman. But with hard work, um, you know, given the importance of this to, to launch the mechanism to really implement Red Plus, I, I feel confident that countries will, the parties will be able to, to adopt this guidance document. Tony, could a failure to agree on the rules for MRV in Durban delay the widespread implementation of Red? Well, it will in the sense that countries will be on their own and how to design and develop their MRV system. So it adds uncertainty, right, in the next phase. But ideally for me, especially if we resolve finance as well in Durban, ideally for me, countries should now actually really fast track in 2012 uh, the development of the Red Plus systems and programs, right? Uh, and it's not going to take a year. It's going to take two or three years to really put that up. So it's not like, you know, uh, so the less uncertainty it is, the better for countries. And the better also for donors, the better for investors. Where are we on financing? Do we need a multilateral framework on mitigation to move ahead with RED? Or can we sidestep that process? That's, that's an, you know, I mean, finance is, in, is an interesting, it's an, in, in an interesting stage, and RED plus finance in, in particular. On one hand, you know, I mean, one can see the hostage of the overall sort of UNFCCC climate finance jam, if you want to uh, frame it that way, or hurdles that, that we are facing given, given the magnitude of, of what's needed and, you know, and, and the willingness of countries, you know, our developed country partners to, to, to put up the money that, that was promised. So that, that, that kind of thing, it's, it's in a way held hostage to that and, and the rules. So in our finance discussions in, in Red Plus countries, some countries have been, you know, very frank that uh, we love Red and we want to move forward in this, but all of this is dependent on what happens in the overall finance uh, structure. But I would say that there are enough parties, I mean a majority of parties, both developed and developing country parties, that actually see that Red Plus doesn't have um, you know, many of the, the problems that are cropping up in other climate finance uh, uh, issues. You know. As long as we deal with safeguards properly, many parties feel that we can actually move forward on Red Plus uh, um, finance. Uh, so in answer to your question, I say, you know, I mean, I, 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 think, I think you can do a double track, not even a triple track uh, approach to, to moving forward on Red Plus and financing Red Plus. I mean, uh, in fact, that's the essence of the discussion so far that I've been having in the group that I facilitate. That people are saying, you know, look, this is Red Plus. Red Plus is a menu of activities. There's also a menu of financial resources available to finance those, those activities. So you can have the multilateral windows, the Green Climate Fund, you can have bilateral funds, you can have national funds, and there's even parties that say there's even an opening even at this stage, at an early stage of private sector finance. You know, not necessarily markets, we always clarify that. Not necessarily markets, probably you know, the world is not ready right now. I mean, with a, with certainly not with a full-blown uh, carbon uh, market or red plus carbon market. That's, that's only possible if there's a full-blown overall carbon market, right? So, so that's, that's not going to be there for a long time. But private sector finance, I think, has a role to, to, to play um, as well. I mean, so, so the challenge in the negotiations is actually finding the framework and agreeing on the framework that allows this multiplicity. You know, I mean, this, I would call it, you know, to borrow from, from Mao Chitung, right? I mean, uh, a thousand flowers. Uh, uh, blooming, you know, I mean, and multiple tracks of financing multiple red plus type of activities as well. That's the key.
With doubts high that we're going to get an overarching mitigation framework anytime soon, what is motivating the private sector to get involved? Market is just one part of of the interest of the private sector, you know, in 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 the area of, of red blast. Certainly, at some point, the carbon market might have will have a role, but uh, because I see that as a theoretical question for now, given the lack of a strong mitigation framework, strong targets by by countries. Uh, uh, you know, you shouldn't derail an agreement on red plus finance just on the single issue, right? Uh, so I'm more in favor of broadening the discussion around private sector finance in general and, and what might motivate the private sector to, to come in from, from anywhere from corporate social responsibility to predictability of, 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 of products that that can come out from forest because of, uh, you know, I think that the problem I think is we're trying to lump all private sector as the finance institutions, right? And so therefore, and that, and that the, all their interest is about, about the market. I think it will be a mistake to, to have the discussion focused just on that. Tony, how optimistic are you that in the medium term, the world's gonna get anywhere close to the 17 to $30 billion each year that UNEP says we need to slow the rate of deforestation? It's how close we are. I mean, I think, I think the, the answer to that is to resolve the pending issues, right? I mean, we will be closer if we are actually able to, well, the, the two things I already earlier mentioned, right? So advance the implementation of preparation plans uh, by, by advancing the discussion on reference levels, settling safeguards because that's so key to getting people to be to be confident that this is a mechanism that will that will that will work and that will not you know dispossess people and not bad for the environment and this we need to settle i think and and i hope we can do that in durban um this idea that red plus finance should be financed from multiple sources the 30 billion will not come from national budgets you know uh, neither will it come from the private sector as if it's like a faucet that the money will just come in. I think, I think we have to, to be creative in those, those, those sources and, and might have to launch various processes, not necessarily within the UFCCC, to get the amount that's, that's, that's needed. Um, and, and I think that's, that's the key. With the negotiations at COP16 in Cancun almost derailed because of the objections of a small number of countries, how can we make the process of negotiations more productive this time around? It's been a pleasant surprise, but this year has been a good year process-wise. Um, parties have really engaged with each other, brainstormed on each other, you know. We had a bad first meeting in Bangkok in April, which was an agenda meeting for one week. But that was necessary because that got parties to, to look at themselves in the mirror, I suppose, and the, 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 the people responsible for the negotiations to look at us in the mirror and say, well, no, this, this is not going to work if we, if we do it this way. So, so I think everyone you know, hunkered down to work and, and Bonn was very fruitful and Panama was very fruitful. So, so I'm actually confident that from a technical point of view, we advance this to the best that we can. You know, this is, this is a, the, the technical negotiators. We'll be able to advance it to the best that we can. Uh, Red Plus Finance particularly, you know, you mentioned a number of countries that, that had difficulties, but we haven't seen that in, in these negotiations. We have seen, you know, people take positions, of course they have to, uh, but they're willing to listen to, to, to each other. So I'm actually confident that we will, we will be able to find a solution specific for Red Plus uh, uh, Finance. Really, the overall challenge is, is in the overall process, right? And, and in particular, uh, what you do with the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, for us in developing countries, that's like a, a test, right? Uh, a line that we cannot cross not to, to be able to accept that the Kyoto Protocol will die. You know, I mean, we, cannot, we, will, we do not accept that and we cannot accept that. Um, but how do you how do you extend it? You know what I mean? And, and, and that's a, a serious question that's as we say, beyond my pay grade to, 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 to answer. So that for me, I mean, uh, 
you know, South Africans come up with some kind of legal mandate to negotiate a new thing. Or, you know, what does that mean? You know, do we mean we basically go back to Bali and you know uh, restart this 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 process while keeping the gains now and moving forward on the decisions that have already been adopted in Cancun and now in 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 Durban and. And maybe, as I've always said, you know what I mean, as, as invested as I am in this process, having been in this process for more, nearly 20 years, uh, I'm one of those really open of saying, you know, this is a good process, uh, we need, it has a role to play, but maybe there are other processes we should consider to solve various parts of the problem of climate change. Uh, and, you know, and, and that we have to consider. And, and, and that's, for forestry, I think that's true. Um, you know, the Red Plus Finance, framework in, in, in the UNFCC is, is important, and it's there. But to think that everything on red will happen under the UNFCCC, uh, I think it's not desirable, even from a financial point of view uh, or a practical point of view. I think we, it would make sense if we actually identify all the different other processes and other venues, as you would put it, to advance the you know this whole approach of reducing emissions from deforestation and and um, and forest degradation, and then that that for me is is uh, we're on the tip of doing that once we actually agree on the Red Plus overall Red Plus framework, including the finance framework for Red Plus and and safeguards and you know, it's like a tree, right? And the branches and they go off, uh, and it's actually good that they go off in different. Uh, directions because the problem is so huge and so big as, as you know that uh, we're better off if it actually branches off but has roots in a very clear policy framework that all countries of the world have adopted. What are your thoughts on the suggestion to include agriculture in red? Would it make the mechanism too complicated? No, you do it in phases. I, I, I support the audit overall concept I mean uh, because for the Philippines for example you know, agriculture and forests are essentially the same already. You know, or there's, you cannot draw a boundary, so it benefits us. Um, and that, that was negotiated, actually. That was discussed in, in, in the run-up to Copenhagen, which I also uh, facilitated. Um, but because precisely of the complexity of just doing, you know, forest, if I remember, this all started as red, just deforestation and forest degradation. The plus means you include conservation, uh, sustainable management of forest, uh, enhancement of, of forest tax, right? So you, you, you add that, that, that's why it's called a red plus uh, mechanism. And then you include agriculture, then you have red plus plus, right? And part to say, you know, the thing is that we're ready with red, with red and we're, there's lots of work already on, on red plus. Uh, but we really haven't done a lot of work on agriculture yet, you know what I mean? And particularly at, among developing countries, you know, measuring emissions, uh, you know, figuring out how to, 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 to mitigate emissions uh, from, from, from land use, uh, soil use, etc. We, we don't have that kind of experience uh, yet on measuring, reporting, verifying, and intervening, intervening to get that done. So you can do this in sequence. So uh, the Cancun decision actually says, that uh, parties will have to discuss this, not for Durban, but for next year. So there will now be discussions, not in Durban, but in, uh, uh, in the next year, uh, leading possibly to a recommendation in 2013, sorry, 2012, in December 2012, in, in the next COP after Durban, on what to do with agriculture, whether to launch a program in a red plus plus program by the time. And you can develop this, 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 these systems differently at first and then eventually integrate them to each other. But agriculture would have it easier, right? Because they would have learned from their forest experience. What impact is the financial crisis going to have on negotiations in Durban? Our partners have not really used the financial crisis as an excuse not to deliver what they have promised, right? But we know it's Affect, affects budgets, right? What countries will be able to commit over the long term. So for me, the real impact is not so much the numbers, but it's the psychological impact that, you know, we realize that there's really not that much money uh, for this, you know what I mean? Uh, although 
the cynical part of me says, but there's a lot of money for, for war and for other things and the useful things, right? So, so this is really just a peanuts compared to other things you spend for us. So, so, you know, I mean, I would, I would like to think that if we had a political will, we can find, we can find the money. The psychological impact, though, is if you cannot rely on national governments and, you know, for in the budgets of national governments, where else do you turn to? Um, and that's why it's important for me, not, and not just for Red Plus Finance, but for, and not just for mitigation, but even for adaptation. How do we get, how do we involve the private sector? Uh, and in a way that there are safeguards as well. You know, that, that, that's key to me. I mean, that, that's my lesson from the Red Plus negotiations. That you can actually move forward on something where stakeholders, the poor, indigenous peoples are involved. The private sector could get heavily involved. Uh, so therefore, it's, that's a recipe for potential disaster, right? But you can actually move forward if there's agreement on the safeguards that, that parties can, can use to ensure that perverse outcomes are not met. So, so for me, um, if the COP in, in, in Durban is able to resolve, able to have a framework on private sector participation, in 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 climate, you know, what I mean, uh, in in a way that is transparent, accountable, you know, just uh, that would such be would be a big advance. So we can really have a broad possible progress on that, is because any rational human being looking at the situation will know that the money is not there, uh, or the money is difficult to find from from national budgets. You know, what I mean, and. And uh, if that's the case, we have to be innovative and creative. In the past couple of weeks, California has adopted a cap and trade system, and a small amount of that money can go towards red. What message is that sending to the world, and in particular to the negotiators at Durban? What's happening in individual states like, like California, you know what I mean? I think it, that has to be heard, and I hope people, uh, not necessarily the US government, but but uh, those who are involved in these initiatives will actually share it uh, with us. But this is an example of what I said earlier, you know, I mean, that, that uh, the more diverse and innovative uh, our sources and our approaches would be, the nearer we will get to the 30 or so billion that we need to really, you know, uh, uh, maximize uh, a red plus approach to, to both climate and, and deforestation. Uh, and, land and forest degradation, you know, we, and dealing with forest or forest challenges. So, so for me, uh, that's an example of, of you know, if you have multiple things like this going on, plus the big, it, the, you, Red Plus will be in GCF, the, the Green Climate Fund as part of the mitigation. Hopefully, later on they will create a Red Plus window. If if Red Plus is is uh, is going to be in bilaterals like like with Norway and and uh, other countries uh, doing Red Plus Finance. If it's with the banks and FCF and all the different, you know, and, and individual states like that, and, and private companies, private, I mean, the thing is to multiple, multiply that and count them so, so that you get to where you want to be. From your perspective, as somebody coming from the Philippines, do you see the voice of developing countries becoming louder and louder in these multilateral negotiations? No, well, definitely. I mean, uh, first, uh, what's called the basic countries, the big developing countries, China, Brazil, uh, India, um, South Africa, they, they certainly have a, a very big and influential voice now, and particularly on, on mitigation. Uh, both, I think, uh, and I over, support overall their, their, their approach, and I mean, offering to do things that they can do. And we know very well how much China is doing in mitigation and Brazil and, and India, you know what I mean? Uh, so we, 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 we know that. And, and so uh, sort of the strategy of, of both offering what they can do, but at the same time making sure that historical accountability you know, remains a principle, uh, that, 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 that I think is being heard. Um, uh, and being very influential in the process. And, and I guess agreement with the United States and the developed countries will depend on how that issue is resolved. Oh, on adaptation, I think countries like the EOSIS countries, countries like the Philippines have had a very 
strong voice uh, have really led the work on, on, on adaptation, which I think is the, really the new thing in this round of negotiations. And I mean, adaptation is just as important now as mitigation. People forget how big a victory that is for developing countries. Mitiga adaptation was not, I would tell you, not in the agenda in the first 10 years of the climate change negotiations. Now it's equal to mitigation. So that's a big, for, that's why for me, the Bali process has been a success, a huge success, because adaptation is now as important as mitigation. We should have done that in 1992, you know, and we wouldn't have lost time in getting countries to prepare for what was coming. Because in 1992, regardless of what we did, climate change impacts were going to come. You know what I mean? The ones that we're fa facing now, we're already committed to do this in the 19, we're committed to this kind of impact way back in the 80s and 90s. So morally, I think countries should have invested already early on in adaptation. Anyway, you know, it's, it's, it's late, but, but it's finally, finally uh, there. And then on Red Plus, this is driven really by developing countries. Uh, you know, the, the coalition of forest nations, uh, Brazil, um, Indonesia, Norway is an important driver, has been very influential in, the, in this process, I, I would say. But, but for me, I, I, that's why I have no qualms about pushing this further and getting this to agreement as much as earlier, because this is a developing country driven uh, you know, process. And, and, the, and thankfully, the developed countries like it. And they have not posed obstacles and have been very cooperative and have been very, you know, um, very um, engaged with developing countries in doing that. So yes, I, I would say that uh, you know, compared to certainly where we were when I first attended the first conference of the parties in Berlin in 1995, when it was all about mitigation commitments of developed countries, or even the Kyoto Protocol in 1990, uh, in December of 1997, which was all about you know emission reductions of, of developed countries. I think we're very much advanced than where we used to be in terms of developing country ownership and participation in this process.